Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, hello, welcome. My name is Kevin Saracino. I'm a member of AmeriCorps. I'm currently serving with Chagrin River Watershed Partners as a watershed steward. And this is a presentation that is called Planting is for the Birds. It's going to be presented by John Barber. And uh, with that, we can go ahead and get started. So, John Barber has been a citizen scientist for over 50 years, active in green space preservation, the recovery of peregrine falcon populations, and continuing recovery of eastern bluebirds. He's now retired after 35 years in the business world and is focused on res restoring and maintaining biodiversity. He continues studies on bluebirds and performs habitat restoration and ecological gardening, gar excuse me, gardening with native plants. He's a native to Shaker Heights. He served on the board of the Nature Center for 10 years, including two terms as the board president. He now serves on the board as of the Native Plant Trust. He's co-leading the Friends of Lower Lake, a program of Donebrook Watershed Partnership, working to restore habitat around the Lower Lake Park in Shaker Parkland. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John and go ahead and get started. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm John Barber, co-chair with my partner, Peggy Spaeth, uh, for the Friends of Lower Lake, an ecological restoration group uh, that is an all-volunteer program of the Donebrook Watershed Partnership. I'm delighted to talk again with the Chagrin River Watershed Partners and its supporters um, as volunteers, as stewards of local parklands, you and we will truly never run out of work. I also want to thank uh, Kevin, Kevin Saracino, for arranging this talk. Uh, very happy to be here. Today, I want to share with you how to use native plants as bird and insect feeders. Birds and insects desperately need us to do that and need us to do that now in our yards, in our parklands, and in our watersheds. One of the ways that I look at it is that every plant that sits in our yard or in our parks or in our parklands, our watersheds, every plant is a decision. And when we look at that decision, we can make a choice over why we put that plant in, why we leave that plant in, why we take that plant out if it's invasive. And so the choice of plants drives so many other aspects of biodiversity um, that uh, today's talk, while it focuses on birds and insects, really does cover all aspects of biodiversity. I hope that uh, everybody has a copy of the handout that went with um, uh, the uh, reminder, as Kevin said. So let's talk a little bit about planting for the birds. Uh, as I think most of you probably have read or have heard, our native birds are in trouble, mostly our native birds. Populations of many resident and migratory species are declining. And some of those declines are very, very serious, like the cerulean warbler, species like that. And what can we do? Uh, these, some of these prognostications are so dire, it's very hard to uh, wrap your head around the fact that we can help this and we can do some very simple things now especially at this time of year as we approach the spring planting season so go with me on this please most seed eating birds the birds that we commonly see around seed feeders if we have seed feeders um, are doing well the populations according to cornell university are pretty stable of things like nuthatches and cardinals and goldfinches and house finches so for the most part, the seed eaters, uh, in part because of what we do, um, have pretty stable populations. The birds that are in most serious decline, the species that are in most serious decline are the species that eat primarily insects. And this is a uh, uh, really the, the genesis of the talk is, if it's our insect eating birds that are in trouble, what do we do about that? There's some very, very simple actions, and I, I list four things, two to do and two not to do, as a way of thinking about how do we approach helping birds and insects. So number one, clean and safe water. Uh, it's easy to put up uh, bird baths. It's easy to keep those bird baths clean by 
uh, changing the water on a regular basis. A number of places now sell either solar or plug-in bird baths where the water doesn't freeze in the winter, provide safe and clean water, Pro and then provide a wide variety of trees and shrubs and grasses and sedges that are native to your area. So today we're in Northeast Ohio. There's so many great things to plant. Never use insecticides or rodenticides like rat poisons. So this is, this is um, again, a very straightforward step. This is a don't take this step. So don't use insecticides or rodenticides. And unfortunately, uh, the lawn care industry and a lot of garden centers make it very easy to buy things that have neonicotinoids in them or other insect killers. Uh, stay away from those. And then finally, never permit cats outdoors. Never ever permit cats outdoors. Um, even if you have declawed a cat, um, it still will upset birds sitting on nests and cause them to flush off more often and nest productivity goes down. Keep all cats indoors. So what's missing from this admonition about helping birds? Well, bird feeders are. Um, and and there's, a, there's a very good reason why this is. Um, by the way, this photograph was not taken in our backyard in Cleveland Heights, but I just love that picture. So what's wrong with bird feeders? Nothing's really wrong with bird feeders. It's just that they've been oversold on how much they help birds. They're wonderful for us. I love bird feeders. I love watching birds on bird feeders, um, but I'm not helping birds themselves out that much um, when I have bird feeders. Why is that? Well, bird feeders, the bird feeding these days is driven primarily by economics. How much seed will you buy and how many different feeders will you buy every year? But seeds feed only a very small subset of birds uh, that are in our yards in Northeast Ohio. Nesting birds cannot feed seeds to their young. So you're not helping feed nestling birds if you put out bird seed. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this today. Nesting success is equal when feeding or not feeding with seeds. Boy, that's interesting. Winter survival isn't increased by seed feeding. So when we think that we're putting out bird seed to help birds live through the winter, studies in England have repeatedly shown no, the birds may go elsewhere in the winter. They may drift further south into warmer climes, uh, but they're not dying off because maybe we forgot to fill the feeder that morning. Feeders do concentrate birds unnaturally. If you think of some of the clouds of house finches that may turn up at a seed feeder. And if these feeders aren't properly maintained, you could be a disease vector. You could be spreading, uh, for those of you who remember house finches with uh, horribly diseased eyes, that was something that was spread, um, a disease that was spread by bird feeders. Um, and a new, some new research suggests that feeders may help support open cup nest predators. Whoa, what a term, open cup nest predators. What does this mean? Well, crows and jays and grackles and cowbirds, even red-bellied woodpeckers, um, will often pluck eggs or nestlings, eggs and nestlings, out of open cup nests. So the, sort of the traditional bird's nest. And some very, very interesting studies have shown that in neighborhoods that have lots of bird feeders, where blue jays and grackles and uh, red-headed, uh, red-bellied woodpeckers uh, are concentrated in high numbers, the nesting success of some open cup species is very low. And it seems to be highly correlated with the number of bird feeders in the neighborhood. Very interesting, a little concerning. And then finally, um, a lot of bird seed and bird suet and mealworms, especially mealworms, have a very large carbon footprint. Uh, not only what it takes to grow them, uh, but also what it takes to deliver them from wherever they're grown to uh, uh, to your door. And the example I'll use, because I'm a, a very frequent uh, bluebirder, is a lot of people have started feeding uh, mealworms, either in the winter or through the year, 
uh, freeze-dried mealworms uh, to help keep their bluebirds around. And as it turns out, in most cases, uh, particularly freeze-dried mealworms are manufactured, quote unquote, uh, in China, in freeze-dried and flown over to the United States and then sold to us. And so I, I question the value of the carbon footprint of these mealworms, uh, bringing them all the way over to the United States and feeling good about uh, helping bluebirds when in fact uh, bluebird populations have always done well uh, without Chinese mealworms. So let's talk for just a minute before I let go of bird feeders about best practices for our bird feeders. And these are best practices that are applicable for bird feeders um, at nature centers, in your backyards, uh, pretty much anywhere you would run a seed feeder. First of all, they are for us. <clears throat> so put them somewhere uh, where humans can en enjoy watching the birds on them. They should always be supplemental. Uh, you should never tell people or even rely yourself on bird feeders as this is all I have to do for birds. It isn't. Always provide high quality bird seed, uh, thistle seed, black oil, sunflower seed. Um, I don't recommend using millet or cracked corn. Uh, here in Cleveland Heights, we have issues, uh, cyclical issues with pigeons and with rats and with deer eating, uh, deer particularly eating cracked corn. Um, and so stay away from millet and cracked corn. And keep an eye on what's feeding on and under your feeders. If you have bird feeders up in your yards and the only thing you're getting are English sparrows or house sparrows, you're really not helping our native birds much at all. A reminder, a very important reminder, particularly at this time of year is to clean under the feeders on a regular basis, rake up all the sun, uh, the shell hulls, the shells of the sunflower seed, uh, the shells of the Niger seed, sweep it up, rake it up, uh, put it in a compost pile if you want or throw it out, but uh, don't leave it around to fester as the temperatures start to get warmer. Okay, let's just leave seed feeders alone for a moment and say, what do birds eat when we aren't feeding them seeds? Because um, so many species of birds that live here or uh, migrate through here uh, feed on something other than seeds. They eat insects, they eat fruit, uh, and they'll eat seeds. But insects and fruit, huge, very, very important. And so what we can do right away, starting this spring, is to start planting a bird buffet by planting native plants in our yards, in our parklands. Why go native? Native plants support insects. In so many cases, <clears throat> the insects that are native to Northeast Ohio have co-evolved with the plants that are native to Northeast Ohio, and they have co-evolved into a very tight web where either the feeding success or the reproductive success of those insects is, is completely dependent on finding certain species of plants that they co-evolved with. And so that mutualistic relationship is absolutely critical to maintain. Non-native plants don't do that. Many of our migratory birds, uh, which are gonna start coming through in the next couple of weeks when the sparrows arrive, uh, eat mostly insects. And so they're looking for insects. They fly all night. They come down to rest and sleep and feed during the day, and they need to refuel. And then finally, almost all, with some very notable exceptions, of our nesting birds here in Northeast Ohio feed their young insects, not seeds. And so a bird feeder feeding insects is not going, uh, feeding seeds is not going to help parents feed their young. What's the role of plants and why am I so adamant about plants? If you look at this uh, balance, I guess, uh, on the left side is what the nursery model has, the uh, plant center model has, that uh, what we should look at for our plants is decorative value. 
what's pretty, what makes a good hedge, what makes a good anchor, what looks good against our houses, what screens our yard from the neighbors. And that's certainly one way to pick plants. But the problem is that you get very little biodiversity when you do that, and you often get invasive species. And so increasingly now, the factors on the right side of this chart are taking on a larger and larger role in selecting plants. What will this plant do for my watershed? What will this plant do for the food web? What will it do for pollinator habitat? And so instead of, folk, instead of purchasing plants where the decision is focused entirely on the left here, we need to start thinking more and more about how we, how we balance that out with all these things on the right side of this chart. What does this mean for birds? Well, habitats with greater than 70% native plants have the highest nesting success. In fact, one remarkable study in Washington, D.C. showed that chickadees didn't even try to nest in, in yards that didn't have greater than 70% native plants by biomass. They didn't even try because they knew they couldn't find the insects to feed their young. Native plant fruits are more nutritious for insects and birds than non-natives are, and that's on purpose because the nursery industry again and again has said, we will sell you things that insects won't eat and they'll stay perfect. The problem is insects won't eat them and therefore insects won't survive there. Native plants once established need less maintenance and water than nursery plants. Uh, and the caveat of course there is once established, it takes a couple years. And although this is uh, yet to be proven, and, and we're all going to be scientists watching this happen, a lot of people are hypothesizing that um, as blooming time shifts and the temperature shift due to climate change, native plants are our best bets. Uh, that's going to be controversial. We'll see what happens. Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid that we're all going to be scientists watching this uh, come about. So when I say that native plants feed um, migrating birds. Um, what do I mean by that? Let's look at this really wonderful study done at Manomet Bird Observatory over in Massachusetts. Um, I'm a bird bander, a licensed bird bander. I handle a lot of birds. Uh, there are a lot of birds that when I handle them, one of their defensive mechanisms um, is to poop, and it uh, it gets pretty messy. So a couple of uh, biologists said, you know, we're sampling what these birds eat as we ban them because they're pooping on our shirts, on our hands. Let's collect that and let's sort out the seeds in the bird's poop and identify those seeds. Wow, what an idea, because then we know what these, what these birds have eaten. And so they, uh, this particular study, I think, had a sample size of about 800 which is just phenomenal, uh, focused primarily on catbirds and uh, some of the thrushes. And so they very carefully sifted out the seeds from each sample of bird poop, and they found that these birds, this was done in the fall when they were migrating south, uh, by far and away uh, were eating blueberries, cherries, raspberries, and um, uh, you know, for example, the prunus is the cherry and black gum and rubus is raspberry and viburnum, you see, you know, those vaccinium is the blueberry plant. Um, they were eating far more native plants than they were the berberus, which is the common barberry uh, or European barberry. And so even this kind of strange sampling uh, of bird poop showed that uh, our native birds, when they're migrating, prefer the more nutritious native plants. Kind of an interesting study, I think. Well, what's wrong with non-native plants? A lot of things are wrong with them. Um, they don't, uh, most of them don't support our native insects. And you can tell that right away. Is anything eating the leaves? Because native insects aren't going to destroy their food source. 
they may leave holes in them and, and that's fine because that means that your food web is intact. In the upper right hand corner is a picture of some English ivy and maybe there's some euonymus growing in there as well. And in the bottom right hand corner is our native ginger. And you can see the difference in the two. The upper right hand corner is feeding nothing. And in the bottom right hand corner, there are little holes where some insects have successfully eaten and have survived on those plants. A number of non-native plants um, have fruit and flowers that is really junk food. Uh, and the sample, uh, the example I'll use is forsythia. Forsythia uh, blooms for two weeks a year. Uh, it supports maybe one species of caterpillar, maybe three. Um, and produces no pollen, no nectar, feeds no pollinators. Um, why do we have it? It's it it, it it might as well be plastic. Um, a lot of a lot of non-native plants are invasive, and we create monocultures. If you look at the upper right-hand corner and think about how many yards are covered in English ivy, and the only thing English ivy does is it might provide cover for small mammals. It certainly has no other value, although it is, uh, it ha now has been shown uh, to be a host for the hideous oak wilt, uh, which we desperately want to uh, knock back. And so on top of feeding no insects and no birds, it's also a host for oak wilt. Oh my gosh. And then finally, um, the traditional nurseries that I grew up with, act entirely on an economic model, not an ecological model. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. I grew up with plant centers and nurseries that said, plant on Memorial Day, mulch and spray and fertilize all summer and discard on Labor Day, repeat the next year and the year after and the year after. And this is how we ended up with uh, impatience and marigolds and things like that. Again, plants that for all practical purposes in the food web could be plastic. And this, this model of buy on Memorial Day and discard on Labor Day completely misses spring and fall migration. And so your yard, instead of being a bird buffet, is a bird desert. Already uh, in today's talk, I've spoken uh, about how some species rely on caterpillars. And I'd like to share with you now this slide from Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, a new book on oaks. A great author, Doug Tallamy. But he and his graduate students studied the food that was brought to nests when birds nested. And they broke it out in general by some families of birds. And so here's a, what, 20, 20 different families of birds. And what was the dominant food brought to nests? And <coughs> for those of you keeping score at home, um, if you look at the um, bar graph from left to right, um, it's uh, dragonflies and then grasshoppers, mantises, cockroaches, true bugs, uh, beetles, caterpillars, flies, and spiders. And so the green bar for every family is caterpillars. And you look at family after family after family of birds, the dominant food is caterpillars. And so if you in your yards and in your parks want so many of our common birds to nest successfully, then you need to provide caterpillars for them. Your yard to be a bird buffet needs to provide caterpillars. And also you can see some of the other big bars are grasshoppers, flies, you know, hummingbirds feed their young, flies and spiders. Okay, what do we do to produce flies and spiders? What do we do to produce caterpillars? So uh, one of Doug's graduate students, Desiree Narango said, okay, where do we find caterpillars? This jaw-dropping slide says, in your yard, if your yard is dominated by zinnias and cosmos and daffodils and hyacinths, you are producing virtually no caterpillars. <clears throat> 
for nesting birds. And you can stop that by replacing plants at the bottom with the species at the top. Goldenrods, we have several dozen species of goldenrods in Northeast Ohio. Clover, asters, the native strawberry plant, sunflowers. Goldenrod plants have, um, on goldenrod plants, Desiree's team found 132 species of caterpillars, 108 species of caterpillars on asters. So if feeding birds when they're nesting and when they're migrating is important, then you grow things on the top half of this slide. What about shrubs? We all have yards and parklands that are full of, of uh, different species of shrubs. So look again, please, at the bottom. Porcelain berry, barberry, privets. Everybody has privet. Budlia, forsythia. And you can see that those shrubs support very few species of caterpillars and therefore do nothing for birds. As a matter of fact, the fruits of buckthorns, glossy and common buckthorns, the fruits of, the, of those two species are diuretic and have a tendency to weaken birds rather than sustain them. So instead, take those shrubs out and replace them with dogwoods, with viburnums, with our native witch hazel, the native witch hazel. And look at the number of species of caterpillars that birds will be able to find on these species of shrubs. This slide to me is so compelling to get up, go out into your yard and put native shrubs and flowers in. Because birds are an indicator and you could say, well, what species am I seeing in the yard and why? If you remove invasive non-native species and replacing them with natives, I argue, and I'm certainly seeing it here in our yard in Cleveland Heights, you will see more species spending more time in your yard. And your yard, may I remind you, is also a source of seeds for the watershed. And so if you have a yard full of privet and barberry, eventually, either by birds or by water or by wind, those things are gonna feed into your watershed. Stop it and instead feed into your watershed the seeds of native plants, native shrubs, and native trees. So let's just go back one more time around because I just can't emphasize this enough. If your yard is dominated by non-native plants, greater than 75% biomass is non-native plants, the English ivy, the privet, the barberry, the daffodils, things like that. You're going to produce 75% fewer caterpillars. You're 60% less likely to have nesting chickadees. That was the species that Desiree and her group studied. If the chickadees try to nest, 1.5% fewer eggs on average, 30% less likely to survive, maturation delayed. So you can see the impact that the plant choices have on the nesting success, in this case of chickadees, but certainly it's going to be shown that it goes through for almost all of our native species. I encourage you to build a bird buffet. Over time, you probably can't do it all in a year or two, but you can start to do this. Trees for canopy. And then understory trees. Oh, we have so many wonderful understory trees, dogwoods and hawthorns, pawpaw trees, sassafras trees, shrubs. And I list quite a few shrubs on the handout that uh, came along with today's confirmation. Always remember that particularly with the holly and holly bushes and spice bush that you need to find both males and females. Um, you want to put perennials in, mass them in clumps. Uh, leave leaf litter, leave the leaves, logs, patches of bare earth, everything you can do to encourage our solitary bees, our pollinators, uh, our beetles. And then finally, something I've added onto this list uh, because it's so important to me um, is 
to grow your dogwoods into thickets and your elderberries into thickets. So give your open cup nesters a place to hide when they make their nests. Make it harder for the grackles and the jays and the red-bellied woodpeckers to steal the eggs. What we wanna do is we wanna provide for birds for all four seasons, not just Memorial Day to Labor Day. We want bugs and buds and shelter in the spring, bugs and nest sites and nest material. We don't need to put yarn out. We put native, we grow native grasses, bugs, fruit, nutritious berries and shelter in the autumn. And then finally seeds and berries and shelter in the winter. And this is all from a marvelous book uh, by a woman named Sorensen, Planting Native to Attract Birds in Your Yard. And you'll find that uh, certainly the county library here in Cuyahoga County, as well as the Cleveland Public Library have copies of uh, Sorensen's book. It's a great book to, uh, uh, to look through. Um, Doug Tellamy has found that keystone species are most critical. The oaks, the cherries, the willows, the birches, these are the trees that support the most species of caterpillars. And for plants, the goldenrods and the asters and the sunflowers, we have so many wonderful plants to choose from um, that are in these uh, genera. Uh, plant these first and you can find them. So this is different. This is different. This is getting away from <clears throat> the uh, go to Home Depot and pick up a bag of sun, uh, pick up a bag of bird seed in the fall and feed all winter. I'm arguing the most important thing that we can do is use habitat as a bird feeder. Habitat as a bird feeder. I get worried a little bit when I look at the what to plant for birds lists, because in so many cases, particularly the older lists, focus only on berries, or they focus on only one species. And that's not good because we have over 400 species of birds that either are resident or migrate through Ohio. And it's very difficult to uh, plant something for each of those 400 species in the hope that they'll come through your yard. I don't like that idea. It's true. If you want goldfinches, plant sunflowers. If you want catbirds, plant elderberries. If you want Cape May warblers, plant currants, because Cape May warblers nectar. Woo, that was fun to discover. If you want winter red poles, plant birches. If you want cedar waxwings, plant winter berries. If you want starlings, plant mealworms. If you want coopers and sharp shinned hawks, plant bird feeders because they'll find them. And so if you try to go species by species, it's exhausting. Plant the widest variety of native plants that your yard will support or your parkland will support. The birds will find you. And I'll repeat again, please leave your leaves and your logs and the flower stalks and the seed heads. At this time of year, it's fine to cut down the flower stalks and the seed heads once the temperatures are consistently above 50 or 55 degrees, but just leave them on the ground. Let those overwintering insects emerge. There's a high ecological value, a very high ecological value in having a little bit of messiness. So make bird feeders your last action, not your first. Again, use no insecticides or rodenticides. Keep all cats indoors. If you have a cat that you say has been trained to be outdoors or whatever, um, build a catio, which is a screened in enclosure on the back of your house where the cat can sit and watch, but don't let it roam. Provide clean and safe water all year round and provide a, plant a wide variety of native plants. Think about your yard all season long, all year long as a bird buffet, and then enjoy the birds in your yard. So I'm often asked, okay, how do I start? How do I start? This sounds huge and it can be big. So start small, but please start now. 
put in a keystone tree or two like oaks, willows, cherries, birches. Put those in in your yard and put them in in local parks. Remove an invasive shrub and replace it with dogwoods. We have four or five species of dogwoods commonly here in Northeast Ohio, elderberry, nonbark, buttonbush. And repeat this often. I would love to see a bounty program where a group like uh, Kevin, the Chagrin River Watershed Partners, has a trade-in program. If you bring in a barberry, we'll give you a native shrub in return. It's a bounty program. If you don't think bounty programs are effective, ask any eastern timber wolf that you find in Ohio. You won't. They were wiped out by a bounty program in the 1800s. Continually transform your yard piece by piece, bed by bed, to a mostly native plant yard. As many natives as you can get in there. And please, volunteer with a group doing ecological restoration. Please get on uh, Kevin's email list. So the Chagrin River Watershed Partners email list, and you can email Kevin to get on that list, where you'll find lots of opportunities for volunteers. Look at the Doan Brook Watershed Partnership uh, website and come do work with us at the Friends of Lower Lake. Go to Euclid Creek, go to the Metro Parks. The Watershed Stewardship Center has wo a wonderful volunteer program, as does the National Park. So there are many opportunities for you to get out in the field and learn more about this kind of planting as a volunteer. If you can't volunteer for whatever reason, then donate to support restoration efforts in the areas where you bird. It is no longer sufficient, it's not enough to log your sightings on eBird and take pictures and keep lists. We need to be rebuilding habitat for our birds. Peggy, uh, my partner Peggy has put together a lot of resources at www.ecologicalheights.com. So please come to that website, take a look at the projects, take a look at the resources listed there. Today's handout is also there. Uh, and I think Kevin's gonna put it on the Chagrin River Watershed Partners. Uh, but again, please start to put a bird buffet in your yard and parklands using native plants. Be happy to answer questions now, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your presentation, John. Uh, we do have a few questions, so if anyone does have any questions, now would be a great time to get them entered. We could answer everything we can. Uh, first question we had is, where can I purchase witch hazel? Like any native nurseries in the area? Um, there are quite a few. Um native plant sales that are going to happen uh, this spring. Um, some of them are pre-orders. Uh, the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes has one. Uh, there are also places like Avalon Nursery, uh, Scioto Nursery down in Delaware, Ohio, uh, Natives in Harmony in Marengo, Ohio. Uh, all of these are listed on the handout. And uh, Native Witch Hazel is probably available at uh, a number of them. Um, you can also start, start them from stakes, stake cuttings, although it's getting a little bit uh, late in the winter to do that. But um, I think you can find them uh, in a number of local plant sales and uh, local native plant nurseries. Okay, uh, next question is regarding clay-based soils in Northeast Ohio, I've read differing opinions on how well trees like black gum, red oak, and white oak can do. Um, I was looking for any like op different larval host plants or trees. Do you have any suggestions? Well, um, this question comes up quite a bit. Do I try to augment my soil? Do I turn the soil? Do I try to change the chemistry of my soil? Um, and I, I would ask uh, people on the call to please, uh, for example, go out to the Metro Parks um, and look around in the Metro Parks uh, where uh, in many cases you'll find that same clay, 
because that's what Northeast Ohio seems to have so much of uh, once you get off the floodplains. And in most cases, the species are doing just fine there. Uh, I get concerned when I think about um, augmenting my soil uh, because there's so many possibilities to bring in contaminants like invasive species um, and also to stir up the seed bank in your soil uh, by turning the soil, rototilling the soil. Um, you have the opportunity to uh, mess up the soil chemistry and also uh, to uh, irritate, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, the invasive species plant seeds and have an outbreak of lily of the valley or something else that's been lurking down in the soil, uh, just waiting for that soil to get disturbed. Um, so my preference is to uh, leave the leaves and start building up your own top layer um, of local leaves uh, and local compost and detritus, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, but not to spend a lot of time or money uh, an effort uh, digging up and pouring bags of topsoil into clay soil, um, the plants are, especially the native plants, are going to do well. Next question. Do you recommend reducing yard size to increase native habitat? Uh, decrease yard size. So I'm assuming, uh, and Kevin, uh, wave if I've got this one wrong, uh, but I'm assuming that the question might be directed uh, toward reducing the amount of grass and replacing that with garden beds. Um, and to me, the answer is yes, very much so, uh, because the ecological footprint of lawns uh, is a disaster from a biodiversity perspective, and from a care perspective with the carbon footprint of mowers and on and on and on. Um, so if you have children and need a play area, you probably have to have grass. Um, you could turn it into wood chips, but you probably would want grass. And uh, you may want to have paths, uh, but I recommend as much as possible removing as much grass as possible uh, wherever you can. Uh, our yard here in Cleveland Heights, which is a small yard, um, has no grass left at all. We've given away the lawnmower, and from my perspective, that was an extraordinarily happy day. Giving away the lawn. Okay, next question. Uh, which native plants will survive heavy deer graze? This question always comes up. Uh, that, that does. Um, deer don't generally graze on spice bush. Uh, they don't generally graze on anything in the mint family, uh, like mountain mint or something like that. Um, and I thought I had on my handout a uh, book about uh, plants that deer in general don't like, but uh, there are some of the more stronger tasting, stronger smelling plants uh, that deer don't like. We do um, have to put uh, small cages around trees when we plant them uh, for both rabbits and deer because the deer population in Cleveland Heights is staggeringly high, uh, seven or eight of them walking uh, down the middle of the street at a time on a frequent basis. Um, and so we do have to protect them and we protect them with every trick that we know. You know, we walk the dog around the garden so the dog can pee. Um, we spray liquid fence on a regular basis. Uh, we put up the salt bags that stink. Uh, at one point, Irish spring soap um, was something you could hang in your garden and that kept the deer away. We run the deer off wherever, whenever we see them near the yard, we fence things. Uh, it's hard. Um, but um, thankfully, I guess in some respects, we have some neighbors that grow large swaths of hostas or deer celery if you want to call it by its true name um, and so the deer oftentimes don't like um, our yard and they'll move to another yard it, there's no easy solution short of reintroducing wolves i got you <laughs> 
Um, I was wondering about what I can plant to attract bluebirds specifically. Well, attracting uh, attracting bluebirds um, is something where probably the most important thing for you to have is a relatively open area, like uh, what is uh, what is thought of as a meadow um, is is a meadow or a prairie, and neither of those habitats are really um, natural for Northeast Ohio anyway. Northeast Ohio was over 95% wooded when the first European settlers arrived and turned it into uh, another English agricultural uh, colony. Um, and so uh, the best thing for you to do is to have as large an open area with a few short trees in it, uh, things like crab apples and things like that, and then have uh, native grasses and uh, shorter native flowers uh, interplanted among the native grasses. Um, I, I think that uh, bluebird habitat in Northeast Ohio um, is probably left to the larger areas like the metro parks uh, where they do controlled burns, which bluebird, you know, controlled habitat burning, which bluebirds just love. Um, but in terms of planting plants to attract bluebirds, um, you'd want to install the largest meadow you can possibly install. It's hard. It's, uh, you know, bluebirds really aren't meant to be here except in agricultural, big agricultural areas, old agricultural fields that have let, have gone fallow and are burned. Uh, Jeff, you have your hand Insects and birds like rhododendron. Uh, most of them, no. Um, I think we have a couple of, uh, we might have a couple of species down in Southeast Ohio that are native. Um, but when, you know, the, when you when you ask a question like that, uh, and I do appreciate the question, uh, the best thing to do is to um, find one in a neighbor's yard or your yard or whatever, um, and then just make a note to look in July or August and see if, uh, the leaves are being nibbled on at all. Uh, rhododendron leaves are very thick, very waxy, very tough leaves. Um, you know, my guess is there isn't too much that that uh, feeds on them, and that's something that some people say makes them more attractive, but it doesn't do anything for the insects and birds. So uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, at least in my book, relative to the dogwoods, uh, in the elderberries, that would be a second tier shrub. Okay, um, here's a question. If there is one thing I could do to make my yard more attractive to birds, what would it be? Mm. Put in um, the largest thicket of native uh, cherries, uh, cherry bushes, cherry trees that you can. Native cherries. That would be, you know, you can't really pick one thing, I'm, but if, if I had to, I'd probably say that. I'd probably say plant a white oak, uh, the largest white oak that you can uh, comfortably plant and uh, nurture it. Okay, uh, looks like about all the questions, I'll give everyone another minute or so to ask any more. So just as a reminder, once this is posted to our website, I'll send out a notification and I'll also include the handout that John Barber included with the link to the presentation. So not seeing any other questions. Is there any closing remarks you'd like to add, John? And then we could go ahead and wrap this up. Nope. Thank you everybody for being here. Please go outside on this beautiful day and and uh plant. All right. Well thank you for your time everyone. Thanks again John. I really appreciate you coming on and presenting again. You're always welcome. So uh with that, I'll uh, go ahead and I'll end the webinar. So thanks everyone for being here and uh, have a nice day.